Well, welcome everybody. Um, like I said, today's talk is on tank talk is on water quality. The first one we did, if you haven't already checked that out, was on fish nutrition. So go back to Facebook. We have it on Facebook and YouTube. Um, very similar format to this. It was on fish nutrition. So a lot of great information that Dr. Nick provided to us um, two weeks ago. So today's talk is on water quality. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Nick, I'll let you go ahead and uh, take us through the talk. All right, thank you, Ian. So this talk is gonna be about water quality and how to take care of your fish and, and the water in your aquarium. It's primarily going to be freshwater focused uh, because salt water is pretty much the same, except then you also have to balance your salinity for salt water. So other than that, the important factors are going to be the same between freshwater and salt water and even uh, koi ponds for pond water. Uh, we talked last week about, or the last session in Tank Talk number one about fish nutrition. And one of the things I pointed out in fish nutrition is it doesn't matter how good of food you feed your fish, if your water quality isn't good, the fish won't do well. So it's the same thing here with, with the water quality is probably the single most important factor in reducing health issues and diseases in your fish. So the first aspect of fish disease prevention and treatment is maintaining proper water quality. And today we hope to show you exactly how to do that. So when we talk about water quality, we're looking at temperature, pH, which is the acid base balance, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, which is the nitrogen cycle, chlorine, which can come in from your tap water, hardness and alkalinity, which are very closely related to pH or affect the pH, salinity, which even in freshwater aquariums, you may have a certain amount of salinity. And of course, in marine aquariums, you have a lot of salinity. And then oxygen. And going along with oxygen, carbon dioxide. And how do you know how to measure these? Well, you need to get a water test kit of some sort. And there's a lot of different ones available. And so these are just some examples from uh, API. There's a saltwater test kit, there's a freshwater test kit, and there's even a pond master test kit. Can you use these for other things? Yes, usually. Most of the tests will work for fresh and for saltwater. Some are a little more specific though, so you might have to be sure that you get a freshwater test versus a saltwater test for a few tests, but many of the tests will work both in freshwater and saltwater. So why is there a separate saltwater test? There are some things you measure in saltwater that you don't really care about in freshwater uh, or, or you don't need to measure as often. So that's why the saltwater may have a few more tests in it than the freshwater test kit. So how often should you test your water? But in a new aquarium where you're just set it up, you're going to have this nitrogen cycle going on where the bacteria are breaking down ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. This process can take three, four, five, six weeks to happen. Uh, you can speed that up by adding uh, nitrifying bacteria, and that might, can shorten it down to maybe one or two weeks, but it still takes a little while. So in a new aquarium, you should be testing your water daily or at least once or twice a week, especially if you're adding new fish, which you should do gradually over a period of time, adding fish into the aquarium. Once your aquarium is stable, meaning you finish the nitrogen cycle so that all the ammonia is converted to nitrite and all the nitrites converted to nitrate, then you don't have to test it as frequently. And maybe once or twice a month would be good when you do your water changes. And we do recommend doing a partial water change Every two to four weeks is usually adequate for an established aquarium. So here's another test kit. This is uh, advanced for aquaculture and it has a lot more tests in it. It has a test for oxygen. It has tests for other things that you might not need for aquarium. I just put this in there because it's an expensive test kit and I have one. So it just kind of shows from one extreme to the other. You can buy some simple test kits at the pet store or online at Live Aquaria. Uh, or you can get some more advanced ones uh, that have a lot more tests available if you're really interested in that. And there's also some test strips. And the nice thing about test strips is they're fast and relatively inexpensive. So when I run a test using a test strip, for example, this five and one, I can get five different tests, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, pH, and alkalinity. 
or I'm sorry, not ammonia, but nitrite, nitrate, pH, alkalinity, and hardness. There is a separate test for chlorine, and there's a separate test for ammonia. But when I do that, I can get a very quick test for five components, and I can see if they're in the ballpark range of being normal. If they're high, these strips aren't really good to tell you exactly how high, so they wouldn't be good for doing a scientific process. But if you're testing just your home aquarium and you want to see, hey, do I have ammonia or do I not have ammonia? This works great because you test it. If it's pink, you got ammonia. If it's white, you don't have ammonia. And it doesn't really matter how much you have. You just know you got to get rid of it. So that's that's the advantage of these uh, quick dip test, because otherwise an ammonia test might take 15 or 30 minutes to run an ammonia test, whereas with the test strip, it takes 10 seconds. Um, so these are uh, nice to have. And then there's also a lot of different meters that you get too. Uh, for pH, I actually like to get a meter because the pH is more sensitive if you're using a meter than it is if you're using a test strip or even a kit where you're using a color chart to match the colors. If you're a marine, you might get a, a, a salt meter to measure your salinity for marine aquariums. And also if you're interested about oxygen, you should get an oxygen meter. Other, otherwise, the test kits work pretty well. For temperature, kits I like to use well. a digital thermometer. And uh, lots of these are available for and, purchase on uh, Lots of these are available for and, purchase on uh, lots of these. So what should they be? Now, again, this is a freshwater tropical aquarium. So temperature, maybe 73 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's a koi pond outside, it might be cooler. Uh, koi are very temperature tolerant. They don't need to be that warm. If you have certain types of uh, a temperate fish, they can uh, live in cooler water. But this is sort of the optimum for most tropical fish. Marine fish also will usually do well in this range, unless they're a colder water marine fish, in which case you might even need a chiller for your aquarium. Uh, pH will vary if you're using, uh, like, for example, discus, very soft water fish, like this discus here. You might want it to have a pH of 6 or 6.5. Uh, in the wild, I've seen in Brazil, uh, water as low as pH 4 with, with discus and other cichlids and tropical fish in it. But in home aquariums, most of the fish we're dealing with are actually captive bred, and they're not from the wild. So they've never lived in this same environment that the wild fish have lived in. So most aquarium fish that you would buy have been adapted to live in water quality based on what our home water quality would be. A few examples like discus, which do require softer water, uh, would, you'd want to drop the pH. Otherwise, a pH of about 7.2 to 7.8 for freshwater fish. Saltwater fish, you might have it a little bit higher, 8.0, 8.2, just depending on what kind of uh, reef animals versus fish or combo you'd have. Ammonia, you never want in the water because ammonia is the waste that the fish produce through their gills, and that ammonia will build up in the water. And if you think about it, it's, it comes out of their gills by osmosis. So it's a passive transfer. So whatever the level in the water is, is the level in the fish's blood. You can imagine if you had ammonia in your blood, that would be very bad. So the fish are constantly excreting it from their gills into the water. But if the water is not getting changed or not getting filtered, you don't have a biofilter running to take that ammonia out, the ammonia level in the water goes up, the ammonia level in the blood goes up, kills the fish. So we don't want that. So it's very important to not have ammonia. Now there is a little note there that says unionized. Okay. Unionized means the ammonia as pure ammonia. But when the ammonia that's excreted from the fish's gills gets into the water, some of it is broken down into ammonium, which is ionized. That ammonium doesn't block more ammonia from coming out. So that's a good thing. But the ammonia concentration that gets converted to ammonium is dependent on temperature, pH, and water hardness and various factors. So in most aquariums, there is a chance that the ammonia level will become toxic. If you have a really low pH, such as maybe discus at 6.0, that ammonia level will be converted to ammonium at much higher rate. In a saltwater aquarium, 
with the pH higher, the ammonia will stay ammonia, not get converted to ammonium as easily, and so the risk is worse. Now, what happens to the ammonia is it gets converted to nitrite, which is also toxic. So you'll see on this chart here, the nitrite is approximately less than 0.1. You really want it to be zero, but there is a certain level where it's not going to be too harmful to the fish. The nitrite is then converted to nitrate, which is less toxic, and it can actually go pretty high. But certain invertebrates and marine fish don't like it much higher than 20. Freshwater fish, you could probably go 40, 80 without any problems, but you really don't want that to go higher. And we'll talk more about that later. Oxygen is temperature dependent. So the higher the water temperature, the lower the level that oxygen it will hold. So an eight to nine is based on the temperature that I have listed here. If you have a koi pond outside and it's cold weather, the oxygen content might be 12. 12 milligrams per liter, and that's okay because it's colder water. Colder water holds more oxygen. If you get an oxygen meter, a digital one, it should have a temperature compensation in it. So when you put the probe in the water, it'll measure your oxygen and it'll measure your temperature, and then it'll calculate saturation. What does that mean? So let's say my temperature is at 73 Fahrenheit. I should have an oxygen concentration of nine. But if the oxygen concentration was actually eight, because the fish have used some up and it wasn't getting replaced, then it would tell me my oxygen was eight, but based on that temperature, it should be nine, so it's you know, roughly 90% saturated, 91% saturated. So, so you know that if you get an oxygen reading, but the, the meter tells you it's not saturated, that's a problem. That means the fish are using up the oxygen faster than it's being produced. So we'll, we'll bring that up again. Hardness and alkalinity go together, and we want to make sure that those are in a certain range that the fish can get the minerals from the water. We talked in the nutrition talk about how minerals get absorbed through the fish's gills, and, and most of the minerals the fish need are absorbed directly from the water. If they're in a mineral deficient water, that's a problem. So you can't use, for example, RO water, the tropical fish. Now you can use RO water to mix with a salt mix to go into marine fish, but you can't use just plain RO water because there's no minerals and the fish need those minerals. And then chlorine in our tap water will kill your fish and salinity for fresh water. You don't need much, but a little bit's good. Marine fish, you'd probably be about uh, three to three and a half percent salinity. Uh, some water, some fish like brackish water fish, you might only be at 0.12% uh, uh, salinity, so about half a marine. Now, you're doing these testing. If you just test it, you say everything's okay, it looks good today, and then you test it again in a, a few days or a week or a month, however you're testing, you may not see a trend that's changing, like your pH is dropping gradually if you don't keep a water quality log. So this is just an example. You should have, you could do it on an Excel spreadsheet. You can do it on a piece of paper. You can do it in a notebook. But you should put a date and the water quality parameters and then keep track of it so that over time you'll see if your pH is dropping or if your pH is going up or other things that can naturally happen in the aquarium. Hey, I was just going to say real quick, I really like the water log, something that been my past experience, something I wish I would have done, been more active with. And I believe even now there's apps that you can download for free on your phone where you can just kind of quickly log each day. It should give you kind of a trend line too. So I, I definitely like that all out specifically. Yeah, and, and that's a great idea about an app on your phone because I do know I've worked with even the API has a meter and the meter logs into your computer. So when you run the test, it'll actually make a spreadsheet for you on your computer. So you could do it that way. So th that would be a, a great thing to do is, is log it into your computer and then it's always available and yep. it doesn't get water spots. There you go. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little more specifically about each of these different things. So temperature, we know some fish can survive in only very narrow temperature ranges. Some fish have very wide temperature ranges. So you kind of have to know that. What's the appropriate temperature for your fish? Most tropical fish, as we mentioned, anywhere in the 70s is fine. That is actually like at 80 to 82. Discus like warmer water. Goldfish and koi like it a little cooler. So those are some things that you kind of need to know. But in general, the fish will do pretty good in the, in the 70s, uh, unless it's a cool water species. And some fish 
if you change the water gradually, will adapt to many different temperatures. But all fish, if you change that water temperature quickly, will cause shock and stress and can even kill the fish. So it's really important when you're moving fish one, one location to another, such as you buy a, buy a new fish and you bring it home in the bag, float the bag in your tank so that the water temperatures equalize between the water in the bag and the water in the aquarium. Don't open the bag till you think, you know, 15 minutes is probably adequate, but uh, longer if the temperature difference was greater. But let the water temperature equalize, then you open the bag, take the fish out, put them into the tank. Don't put the bag water in your aquarium. Um, so probably uh, up to two to three degrees Celsius or five degrees Fahrenheit is as much change as you would want to happen quickly. Anything more than that, you want to do it gradually. And um, we also need to know that the temperature will affect saturation of oxygen. We just talked about. It'll also affect the concentration of other things in the water. Uh, and we do know that ammonia is more toxic at higher temperature, less toxic at lower temperature. And the fish's me metabolic rate will change with temperature as well. So in warmer temperature, they'll want to eat more and be more active. Okay, the next topic is pH. pH, what, everybody hears pH, but nobody even knows what it means. What is pH? Well, it's P for power, H for hydrogen. So potentia hydrogenae in Latin, or the power of hydrogen. And it's a measurement of the hydrogen ion. So that's why the H is always capitalized, because it's H stands for hydrogen. That's the molecular symbol for hydrogen, is the capital H. So that's why when you see pH, it's always a capital H, because it's the P for power, H for hydrogen. And it's just a measurement of how much hydrogen is in the water. Well, all water contains hydrogen. It's hydrogen hydroxide. It's a hydroxyl ion and a hydrogen ion coming together, okay? But the combination of hydroxyl OH negative and hydrogen H positive is not always the same. So if I have my water here, a little circle, water H2O, if my hydrogen level is more than my hydroxyl level, that makes the water acidic. If they're equal, the water is neutral. And if the hydroxyl ions are greater than the hydrogen ions, the water is basic. Some people call it alkaline, but alkalinity is actually a little different. However, alkaline water will have a basic pH. So, so they're consistent. So when you have a pH of seven, you have an equal number of hydroxyl and hydrogen ions, you got pure water. If you have an imbalance, higher hydrogen is, is a, a lower number, more acidic, Higher hydroxyl is a higher number, more basic. Okay, so we now we know that. So we also know that fish can live in a pretty wide range. If the, the pH, like temperature, if it changes slowly, if it changes rapidly, that will kill your fish. If it changes slowly, the fish will adapt because it affects their enzymes, affects their metabolism. And as long as it's a gradual change, they can adjust. So we don't want that pH to adjust more than probably about 0.2 or 0.3 units at a time. Now, that seems like a pretty little change from like 7 to 7.2 or 7 to 7.3. But if we think about 7 to 8, one unit, 10 times change in hydrogen ions. To so go from seven to nine, it's 100 times change. So, so these are exponential numbers, base 10, so that if you change one unit, you're changing it 10 times. So if you change from 7.0 to 7.3, you've actually doubled the level of hydroxyl ions in that case. Uh, so that's why small changes are okay, rapid changes are not good. Now, over time, the natural acids that come from fish food and fish waste and just uh, carbon dioxide from the fish breathing, they produce acids in the water. Acids have high hyd hydrogen ions, so acids will drop the pH. So in any aquarium, if you're not doing water changes, your pH will gradually go down. The fish will adapt. They'll be fine. But if you put a new fish in that tank from a, a tank that has higher pH, 
suddenly that fish will have all kinds of problems, yet the rest of the fish that are swimming around in the tank that have already been there are no problem at all because they've adjusted to it. So, so you have to watch that. So one of the things we can do, and we're going to talk about this on, on the mineral slide, is buffer the pH. And that means adding minerals that when the carbon dioxide and other acids get produced in the water, those minerals will bind it so that it doesn't change the pH. Okay, so let's see. We'll talk a little bit more about those. The next thing that's really important to understand, and this is, it, it's science, but it's not hard science. It's the nitrogen cycle. We talked about fish produce ammonia. That's their waste. So we urinate um, urea, which is an ammonia-containing compound. Birds and reptiles create uric acid, which is also an ammonia-containing compound. But since fish live in water, they can excrete the ammonia from their blood through their gills directly in the water. So they don't have to convert it into anything else. Ammonia is a byproduct of protein. We talked about that on the last talk. Protein produces ammonia in the blood. Any protein that doesn't get metabolized gets excreted and it comes out as ammonia. So this ammonia goes in the water and if you'll see here where it says start here, it gives the food. The food is, contains protein. The protein gets digested by the fish. Part of it gets pooped out. And so that produces ammonia. So not only pooping it out, but also coming directly from the gills. If there was no biological filter, so you just set up the aquarium, that protein and that ammonia gradually increases, kills the fish. So what do we do? We have to have a biofilter that breaks down ammonia. And it's actually bacteria, beneficial bacteria, nitrosomonas, nitrobacter, nitrospire, all of these bacteria that, that break ammonia into other compounds and they break it down into nitrite primarily. So once you get this bacteria growing, they'll convert ammonia to nitrite. Well, nitrite's still toxic, so that can hurt your fish. Now, it's less toxic than salt water because the salt prohibits nitrite from being absorbed. So saltwater fish, and if you have an aquarium that has high nitrite on a freshwater aquarium, add some salt, 0.2%, uh, so two parts per thousand. 0.2% is a really good level to combat nitrite toxicity, toxicity in a freshwater aquarium. Um, but then the bacteria will convert nitrite to nitrate. Nitrate is the end product of the met metabolism of protein and, and uh, nitrogenous products. Nitrate is not directly toxic, but will gradually build up in the aquarium unless you're doing water changes to take it out. The nitrate is one of the three components of fertilizer, phosphorus, potassium, and uh, nitrogen nitrate. So th those will cause your plants to grow real well, but it'll also cause algae blooms if you let that nitrate accumulate. So uh, you want to make sure that you're doing regular water changes. And if you're testing your nitrate, we already talked about 20 parts per million as being a, uh, a normal nitrate level or less. So if you're doing water changes, you see your nitrate start going up higher than that, time to do a water change. That's a good indication of how often you should be doing water changes by just maintaining the log and see how quickly your nitrogen, your, your nitrate goes up. Uh, there are some other things that can remove nitrate from the water, but most aquariums don't have those. They're anaerobic processes. Uh, so primarily in uh, freshwater and saltwater aquariums, nitrate is absorbed by algae, absorbed by plants, and will be um, removed through water changes. Okay, let's go on from there. Okay, so if you're using tap water with your aquarium, unless it's well water, it probably contains chlorine. And most cities put in about one to 1 1.5 milligrams per liter or parts per million of chlorine in the tap water. That's not a whole lot, and it's easy to take out of the water using the dechlorinator. However, something people don't realize is in some cities, when you have heavy rainfall, the rain saturates the soil, gets into the water pipes, and the water people know, hey, we could have some contamination going on in our water pipes in heavy rainfall. So they're going to pump that uh, chlorine up to like five parts per million. And, and they don't tell you that. 
So you maybe have been doing water changes and you didn't use a dechlorinator because you're only doing a small water change and never had a problem. And then one day you do that and then the fish die. What happened? Well, it could have been just at a spike in chlorine. Now, chloramine is chlorine that has ammonia added to it to bind the chlorine so it stays in the water for a longer period of time. It doesn't evaporate out as easily as chlorine does. But now you've got two things that are bad, chlorine and ammonia, because they'll eventually break down. So if you have a city water that takes chloramine, you might need to use a different dechlorinator than you use just for chlorine. Uh, regular chlorine, we use sodium thiosulfate. Uh, for chloramine, we want to use something that also takes out the ammonia. If you have a good biofilter, when you do your water change and you add the dechlorinator, if it's just sodium thiosulfate based, it'll take out the chlorine, but it won't take out the ammonia. But your biofilter will take care of that ammonia. Uh, so you just measure both chlorine and ammonia. And um, it's, you know, again, it's, it can build up very quickly in a water change. And the typical example, and I've had this unfortunately happen to people I know where they'll be, uh, especially with koi ponds, they'll turn the water flow on, put the garden hose in, filling up the pond, they get a phone call or otherwise are distracted, leaving that water going on. Now, if you only added a little bit of water, the chlorine would be uh, diluted and it would have probably been okay. But because you add more water, the chlorine isn't diluted, and so suddenly you've got a high level of chlorine in the water, and now the fish die. And unfortunately, that's happened in many cases, uh, doing a water change, not adding dechlorinator, or leaving the water running, and the chlorine level goes up and kills your fish. So whenever you're adding water to your pond or your aquarium, do use the appropriate dechlorinator. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about hardness and alkalinity, which remember what we talked about pH, they're very important at that. So hardness are the cations, calcium, magnesium, uh, things like that. And alkalinity are the anions, which is the carbonates, hydroxide and carbonates primarily. In both fresh water and salt water, the main components of hardness and alkalinity is calcium carbonate. So we usually test these in terms of measuring calcium carbonate. In salt water, there's more minerals than in fresh water other than calcium carbonate, including sodium chloride and magnesium and phosphorus and things like that. In fresh water, there's very few minerals in the same quantity as calcium chloride in the water. Or, I'm sorry, calcium carbonate. And so when we measure it, you can use uh, different types of tests, different types of meters that will measure the hardness and alkalinity. And one is measuring calcium, one is measuring carbonates. And you can express this in milligrams per liter. Uh, it's often expressed in DH, which is the degrees of hardness, which is a German measurement. So it's also called Duchartgard, which is German hardness scale. And uh, so if you see these things that will say like hardness of, of 3DH, okay, what does that mean? Well, it's 17.1, roughly 17.2 times that. So if you had a, a DH of 2, uh, degrees of hardness of 2, that's going to be about a 34 milligrams per liter hardness of calcium carbonate. So unless you're wanting really soft water for, again, discus or things like that, you, you normally want your hardness to be about 50 to 100 or 150 milligrams per liter. Softer water will have water changes that happen more rapidly. Harder water with higher alkalinity will be buffered and have fewer pH changes and other effects. The alkalinity, however, is used up by bacteria in the biological filtration process. The hardness is not. So over time, your hardness can go up because of evaporation leaves the calcium and the magnesium behind. So koi ponds where people are just topping off the water instead of doing water changes, and I'll measure the hardness, for example, and it could be like 750 milligrams per liter, parts per million. And it's like, oh, well, that's way too high. Fish were fine, but it shouldn't be that high. It should be 100, 150. The alkalinity, however, will go down 
And as that alkalinity goes down, the pH will start shifting up and down. And especially in outdoor ponds with sunlight and algae, you'll see daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime shifts of pH, which can be harmful to the fish. Inside in an aquarium, those shifts won't be as bad. But you do want to maintain your alkalinity. If it gets too low, what do you do? Well, test your tap water. You probably have normal hardness and alkalinity in your tap water. So doing water changes will build your alkalinity back up. If you have very soft, very low alkalinity in your tap water, then you probably need to buy a supplement. Uh, there's calcium blocks, there's uh, sodium uh, bicarbonate or calcium carbonates that can be added to the aquarium to raise the alkalinity. So that's something you can measure. And if you see a problem, there are things you can get at your local aquarium store or online that can fix that. Live Aquarium actually has uh, our own brand uh, of those products too. So definitely check out liveaquarium.com. We've got some of those products for you. And highly recommend it. Yep. Um, fresh water, we talked a little bit about salt. Salt is good in small amounts for freshwater aquariums. Salt will help the fish develop a nice slime coat which is protective against some external parasites. So sometimes you'll read in a book that you have a parasite on your fish and you can treat it with salt. Well, the salt won't kill the parasite. However, the salt will help the fish get a protective slime coat, which can help reduce the damage caused by parasites. But you still need to use appropriate uh, medication if you're finding parasites on your fish. But the salt will help the skin. It uh, also, there's an osmotic difference between the blood, the salinity in the blood, and the salinity in the water. So in fresh water, it's we're going to just call it like 0.1% salinity. In salt water, it's point it's 3.5% salinity. So you got here. Well, the fish's blood is 0.9% salinity. So it's in between the two. So there is this osmotic difference between the fish's blood salinity and the water, either higher salinity in salt water or lower salinity in fresh water. So the fish is constantly trying to excrete salt in salt water or retain salt in fresh water. And it's a, it's a continuous balance. Uh, so in freshwater fish, sometimes you can add salt to fresh fish, usually about 0.3, maybe even 0.4% salinity. So three to four parts per thousand, depending on how you're measuring it. Whereas in saltwater fish, you sometimes lower the salinity down to from three and a half percent to three percent, or maybe even a little bit lower than that, to reduce that osmotic difference between the fish's blood and, and the uh, environment. And that's will help reduce stress on the fish temporarily. Uh, probably most of you who've had fish for a while, freshwater fish, will have seen fish that bloat up. We talk about um, a dropsy is a, the common term for it. It's edema. Uh, the fish is absorbing water. Freshwater fish are constantly excreting water in the urine. So they do produce urine, but their urine is almost pure water because uh, they're constantly uh, pumping water out of their body with their kidneys. So fish that end up, freshwater fish that end up with kidney disease and they can't pump that water out will start absorbing water and blowing up like a balloon and their scales will stick out from their body and you'll see fish with dropsy. So that's a symptom of renal disease that's causing the fish to get more water in it than going back out. And that's a big problem. So just an example of where something like adding salinity, increasing salinity in that might help the fish a little bit. So for freshwater fish, I just have on here one teaspoon per gallon is going to bring it up to about 0.1% salinity. So you could go one, two, or even three teaspoons a gallon. So three teaspoons is a tablespoon. So a tablespoon per gallon would bring it up to about 0.3% salinity. And that might be a good thing to do whenever your fish are stressed or if you're bringing new fish into the aquarium. And then after they adjust, you do your water changes with the regular water. That's going to bring that salinity back down. Uh, so how do you know what your salinity is? Well, for salt water, there's these little um, refractometers and floating uh, uh, salinity meters. There's also lots of digital ones. And I do recommend 
you do use a refractometer or a digital meter uh, for both fresh and salt water if you're planning on using salt. A lot of koi pond people add salt to their pond, but if they're not measuring it, they don't really know if they've added too much or too little. So you really do need to get uh, a meter if you're using salt. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are probably less measured than other compounds, and that's because in most aquariums we have adequate aeration, we've got a filter, we've got an air pump, whatever it is, it's moving the water. The motion of the water is what aerates the water. So even if you have an air stone, you know, you got the little air stone that has all these little bubbles coming up to it, the bubbles are not putting oxygen into the water. And that's kind of a misconception. I think, oh, I put an air stone in there, I'm gonna increase my oxygen. It will increase the oxygen. But what the bubbles do is they're pushing water from the bottom to the top. And the surface of the water is where oxygenation occurs. So those air bubbles or a water pump, whatever it is, if it's bringing water to the top of the tank, it's gonna get oxygenated at the top. That top water is gonna circulate back down. New water is gonna go up and that's what oxygenates the water. Now there's a problem. If you had, for example, an air stone, but the air stone was only an inch below the surface, it's not bringing the water from the bottom up to the top. So it's gotta be all the way to the bottom. The other thing will happen is if you have a, a, a filter where the water going out and the water going in are maybe right parallel to each other at the surface. And so the water is just going across the tank in one side and out the other, and it never goes down. So on your filter, you wanna make sure that water is going down to the bottom, coming out of your filter, so that it's pushing the bottom water back to the top where the oxygenation occurs before it goes out into the filter. And that's a big problem in koi ponds. A lot of ponds will have a flat surface that uh, the water goes on one side and comes out the other, never gets deep in the bottom. So the bottom water gets stagnant and it gets low oxygen. Um, and so you can measure that. You can use an oxygen meter, measure different depths in a pond, or you can measure it in your aquarium and see how you're doing. Uh, the higher the temperature, and the higher the salinity, the less oxygen water will hold. So they have to keep that in, uh, in mind. For, again, for koi ponds in the summertime, they might not have enough aeration and water circulation when they were fine all winter and all spring when the temperature was cooler. And then suddenly the temperature is hot and maybe the, maybe the pump fails, the waterfall stops, the circulation stops, and then the fish are starting gasping at the surface trying to get air because they can't. Uh, they, the only water that has oxygen is that surface layer. Deep down, there's no oxygen. So the fish will swim along the top, sucking off that water at the surface to get their oxygen. And a kind of unusual problem that doesn't happen in aquariums, but we do see it in ponds, is uh, I mentioned the difference between daytime and nighttime, where if you have sunlight and aquatic plants, even algae that produce uh, photosynthesis and produce oxygen during the day. But remember, plants respire in the absence of light. So just like we respire, we take in oxygen, we give off carbon dioxide. In sunlight or bright light, plants take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen. But if it's dark out or there's no light, no sunlight, the, the plants breathe just like we do, essentially. And so at nighttime, plants are absorbing oxygen out of the water. So if you have a very green water, for example, and especially in the summer when the water is warm and the fish are in it and the plants, there's no light, they're going to suck all that oxygen out of the water and in the morning time the fish will be gasping for air or dead. So that's something to consider about the aerating the water uh, at nighttime if you have a lot of plants, uh, maybe even more so than you need to during the daytime. And here's a, a kind of an unusual situation that I've seen in several different cases uh, that's related to uh, gas saturation. And we, we talked about the oxygen meter that will get the temperature and then give you the saturation point of oxygen and tell you if it's 100% saturated or lower than 100%. If it's lower than 100%, you can increase your aeration. But what happens if it's over 100%? That can happen in warm water where the water pressure is really high. And then the, the little picture right here, this is a koi pond and they had the outflow from a pump spraying down right onto a cement slab. 
and then that the water on that cement slab was then flowing into the pond. So the water wasn't going directly into the pond. And what was happening is you see all those little bubbles that are there. That's just water under pressure creating a bubbles that get absorbed into the water as it goes into the pond. And now you have water that's super saturated. If, if it's usually, if it's warmer water, it's harder to do that if it's cold water, but if it's warmer water and this was the summertime. And so the fish absorb the extra dissolved gases, nitrogen and oxygen uh, that's in there and they absorb it in their body. And it, it's kind of hard to see. If you look real close on the fins here, this is a koi, this is a dorsal fin. And if you look at the membrane between the dorsal fins, you see tiny little circles. Those are gas bubbles. The fish has absorbed that gas through the gills. It's gone through the bloodstream. It comes out of solution in the blood as a gas bubble. And it can get in the eyes, it can get in the skin. Usually it's easiest to see on the fins. So that's where you notice it. And uh, it's the same thing as a scuba diver getting the bends. They get saturated with gas, they come up to a lower pressure, the gas expands, becomes bubbles, blocks the blood flow, and can kill them. In this case, I've seen fish that lose their fins because it blocks the capillaries and the fins will just rot off. If it gets into the heart or maybe the brain, it can cause the fish to die. Um, but if you get it back into normal saturation level, the fish will blow that off, uh, eventually get it out of the bloodstream, get it back out the gills into the water and they can recover. Uh, so I mentioned in this particular case where you're looking at the water pump uh, as the cause of this, but it can also happen in an aquarium. If you get a, a, a crack in a pipe that's as the water is flowing through, sometimes like if you shut the pump off, the water would drain out. But because the pump's turned on, the water's flowing by so quickly, this little crack or, or loose fitting, that it actually creates a vacuum that sucks air in. And sucking air in will cause this to occur. Uh, it's a venturi type effect. If you ever use a venturi in, in your aquarium or pond, where you're sucking air in because of the water flow, but you can supersaturate it with that way. And we talked about how algae produces oxygen in the sun. If you have very high levels of oxygen, uh, of algae in warm water, in bright sunlight, they can produce oxygen so readily that it'll get super saturated in the water. And you'll see tiny, tiny little bubbles like champagne flowing through the water that is a, a sign that the water is getting super saturated. Uh, so, so just think about it. super saturation is a champagne bottle. That bottle is super saturated with carbon dioxide before you open it. Once you open it, it all, it can, you know, bubbles out, but even when you pour it in the glass, all those tiny bubbles, that's the super saturation being released. And so you start seeing those tiny bubbles in your pond or aquarium, that could be a sign of super saturation. And you need, need to check your filter, check your aeration to fix that. I think we're almost to the end here. We've got uh, just a couple topics, uh, toxicity in ponds specifically. You can get toxicity in aquariums also, you know, um, inadvertently kids pour stuff in, pond, in your aquarium. Uh, you know, they, they put things in the aquarium that could be toxic, uh, but normally the only toxicities we would see in an aquarium would be maybe chlorine from a water change or ammonia nitrite and nitrate. But in a koi pond, there's a lot of things that can get in outside. So I've had clients that have uh, sprayed the lawn with chemicals that then they rained and the rain went into the pond and killed the fish. I've seen spraying trees to prevent the olive trees from blooming so they don't get the olives and the chemical falls in the pond and killed fish. Uh, fertilizers, oil from a, a driveway, antifreeze from a driveway, and again the water runs from there in a rainstorm into the pond that can kill your fish. Uh, heavy metals like copper, which can be in your piping. So copper pipes leach copper and can actually reach toxic levels, especially in new housing or new construction where the copper pipe hasn't got a patina or a, a coating inside of the copper that will uh, protect it from leaching copper in. Um, lead, lead pipes can leach lead. And uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide. Oh, so there's two different pictures here. And of course, these are both koi. The first top picture, a bunch of fat koi and goldfish this came from a pond at a golf course, and I was working with them. They had this sudden fish kill. And what had happened 
is they had done this big water change on the koi pond at, on a golf course and never thought about using a dechlorinator. And so these fish were all healthy, but they did a water change and the water had enough chlorine in it. And they did a large enough percentage of water change that they killed their fish with chlorine. So that can happen. The bottom fish, uh, I don't know if you know what it's supposed to look like, but the, the, when you open a fish, it shouldn't be red like this. I mean, th there's there's colors to different yeah. organs, but they shouldn't be bloody and they shouldn't be this dark red. This particular one is hydrogen sulfide, which is that rotten egg odor. And if you ever smell a rotten egg odor when you're working with your fish in a pond or an aquarium, aquarium filter, cleaning the filter, that means you have anaerobic bacteria. Those anaerobic bacteria produce hydrogen sulfide and that can kill your fish. So you can detoxify it with uh, um, hydrogen peroxide or potassium permanganate to, to oxidize the hydrogen sulfide and, and break it out. Good aeration will make it just gas out as well. Uh, and so if you're cleaning a filter and you smell the rotten eggs, make sure you do a water change afterwards or add, add some kind of uh, oxidizer to get rid of that. So in this particular case, this was a koi pond at a hotel. They had gravel on the bottom of the pond. They didn't like the looks of it because it kept trapping debris. So the workers went out and they cleaned all of the gravel out of the bottom of the pond. And then the next day, all the fish were dead because in, in cleaning it, they released all that hydrogen sulfide gas that was trapped in the gravel in the anaerobic bacterial conditions of the waste that built up. And so if, again, if you smell it, do a water change afterwards to get that gas out. And so how do you treat all of this stuff? Well, I think we're going to finish off here with just a, a little uh, treatment options. And there, there may be more, more things you can do than just these. But uh, the, the things that are, uh, you can buy commercially that will help you out. Uh, and of course, remember, the solution pollution to pollution <laughs> solution. OK, so whenever you do a water change, if you're using good, clean water, that's the right hardness, alkalinity and pH, you've treated for chlorine, it has no ammonia, no nitrite, no nitrate. You're doing that water change. You're making the fish better. Um, so if you do see ammonia, there's a number of different products available, ammo lock, Amquel, ammo this, ammo that, that all contain uh, a chemical hydroxymethane sulfonate or a similar compound that binds ammonia. So it doesn't remove it, it neutralizes it, and makes it into a non-toxic form. It's still in the aquarium, the bacteria will still break it down, but it doesn't prevent the fish from continuing to excrete more ammonia from its gills. So if you have an ammonia problem, add that. There's a couple newer compounds that will also bind nitrite and nitrate. So those are good ones to try as well. Uh, the nitrite, if you see that going up, you can add salt, as I mentioned, in a freshwater aquarium. You can uh, increase it to about 0.2%, so two parts per thousand for salinity will help block nitrite absorption so the fish doesn't get nitrite toxicity. Chlorine, you can use sodium thiosulfate. The uh, hydroxymethane sulfonate also deactivates chlorine. So you can use that for both ammonia and chlorine, whereas the sodium thiosulfate only removes chlorine. Now, these are also dose dependent. And usually on the bottle, the dose is for one milligram per liter of whatever you're using it for. So like one milligram per liter of ammonia. So let's say you have three milligrams per liter of ammonia in your aquarium. You need to use three times the label dose. Uh, so it's the same with chlorine. Uh, the, the dose on the bottle is usually designed to produce reduce one milligram per liter of chlorine. So if you measured your chlorine and it was two, you'd have to double the dose. And sometimes they tell you that on the bottle and sometimes they don't. And some companies may even you know give you a little extra in there just to make sure that it, you're, they're covering it. But that's typically how they calculate the dose based on aquariums. Uh, copper can be toxic. It can come from your tap water. But you can also use chemicals that contain copper to kill parasites, which is a good thing to do. But if you overdose it, uh, you can use sodium EDTA, which is found in things like stress coat and some other products that will bind copper and reduce the copper toxicity.
Uh, hydrogen sulfide is not commonly found in aquariums, but anytime you have an anaerobic bacterial action and you get that rotten egg smell, that's hydrogen sulfide. And you can use potassium permanganate. You could also use hydrogen peroxide, about two milligrams per liter to, to break down the hydrogen sulfide. Uh, if you're low oxygen, obviously increase your aeration. Increase your filter flow, put in an air stone, whatever you can do. But let's say your power is out. Okay, so your, your power is shut down, you've got your aquarium, monitor your fish, they'll, you know, they'll be swimming around, everything's okay. They start coming to the top, start gasping for air, you know the oxygen's getting low. You can just stir up the water, that will help. But you can also add the 3% hydrogen peroxide, the kind you get at the drugstore, and one milliliter per gallon will work for about 24 hours in releasing oxygen into the water. Uh, now, it varies depending on how many fish you have, but if you do put that in, stir it all up, and then monitor your fish, you may need to add more later or stir it up later, but it'll get you through a crisis if you know the power is going to be out for you know, more than an hour or two. And then uh, low alkalinity, there are products you can buy at the, um, the fish stores or on online that will increase or decrease your alkalinity, which will raise or lower your pH. Uh, and at home in a pinch, uh, you did a water test and you did maybe even you did a water change and you find your alkalinity is real using sodium bicarbonate, adding it to the water one teaspoon per 10 gallons. That will raise the alkalinity, which will also increase the pH. There are other things you can use to increase alkalinity like uh, calcium carbonate or oyster shell, dolomite, crushed corals, things of that nature that will release calcium carbonate into the water. When you have any kind of water problem, it is important, however, to find it quickly and correct it. And again, water changes are one of the best ways to do that. But remember to test your tap water to make sure that when you're doing your water change, you're using good water. And that about wraps up water quality for today. Awesome. Well, this is a quick outro. Uh, first, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Nick, for your time and your expertise, you know, this information and presented it to everybody. Uh, and thank you to the viewers for staying tuned and watching through this, uh, what came to be about an hour long. Uh, so thank you, everybody. I hope you're enjoying these tank talks. We welcome any questions or comments you may have about this format. And, uh, you know, we're open to new ideas and ways to improve it too. So please feel free to share that feedback with us and hear it. Uh, so we'll be back. Uh, and two weeks from now, on the 18th of January at 1 p.m. CST, we'll be bringing our next topic, which I believe we talked about quarantine and conditioning fish, dealing with parasites, types of thing, Doc? Does that sound, sound like the plan? Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Nick, for your time. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.